All right, you're live. Okay, welcome everyone in Facebook land. You're joining our Zoom meeting for East Valley Fourth Trimester Village Gathering. We have these gatherings once a month from 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. the third Thursday of every month. My name is Jennifer Hofrich and I'll be your host for these gatherings. And I'm very pleased today because we have a really important and intriguing and exciting topic. Today we're going to be talking about fourth trimester or postpartum ceremonies and how um, birthing people and their babies and their families are honored in different parts of the world and here in the U.S. And so if you have a story that you'd like to share of something beautiful that you've seen, um, you can go to the event and you can click on that link and register and come on uh, onto the Zoom with us. It's not too late to join us and then you can be sharing with us right here. So welcome. It's now my pleasure to get to introduce our speaker for today. She'll be leading our discussion around this. Um, this is Wendy Kleckner. She is a licensed midwife, a certified professional midwife, and she has her JD. Wendy is a midwife, herbalist, lawyer, and women's rights activist. In 1993, she helped a friend in the birth of her first child and felt a passion to devote her life to moms and babies. The calling of midwifery has blessed her with travel across the world, taking her all over Asia and Africa. Wendy has been involved with solo and partnering home birth practices in Arizona for the last 20 years and currently practices at Freedom and the Seed. And Wendy was also my teacher, uh, my midwife teacher, what that was like what, 12 years ago or something like that. So, and she continues to be a mentor for me and I just love and respect this woman so much. So Wendy, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Jen. I love you so much. I love your passion and your zeal. So it comes through with everything you do. Thanks for that introduction too. Um, it is a great pleasure to be here today. Uh, I, as I said in my earlier introduction, I um, have wanted to come to these so many different times and um, things have prevented it. But I just am so grateful for places where we can gather as um, humans to hear from each other, to be together, to listen, to share, to cry, to laugh, to whatever comes up. It's just so, so, so important that we um, have these opportunities to be together. Community is vital. And you're going to hear that throughout all of our discussion today. Um, as Jen said, I am a midwife. I've been a midwife for 20 years, and it has brought me all over the world. So I'll be sharing different stories through some of the places I've been and um, how that has come through um, in the ceremony or rituals or, or practices that are done in the postpartum period. Um, so I'm excited to share some of those stories. And I, truly, my life is an open book. If things aren't shared here, but you have more questions about anything, I'm always available. So don't ever hesitate to reach out to me um, in all the various forms that we reach out to each other um, on all the social media stuff. So thanks again for letting me be here. Um, so today's topic, uh, ceremonies and rituals. Um, I have designed this talk to be very, very interactive. So I'm going to rely on you guys to jump into the conversation a lot. Um, so I'll be asking a lot of questions. I want to hear stories. Um, but first, I want to start with just these words, ceremony, ritual. Um, I want to know how these words make you feel. What are the thoughts that come up just with these, not having to do with postpartum, not anything else, but these words, what, what do they conjure up in you? How do you feel them in your body? What, do they, what, is it, do, what does it do to you when you hear these words? Is everybody welcome to type that into the chat or just unmute if they would like, Wendy? Yes, that's great. Either way. Yeah. If somebody could be watching the chat, though, because I don't know that I. Yes, I'll do that. And then if people are typing in the chat, I'll read that out loud for you. Great. But please feel free to just unmute and share your thoughts. I'll, I'll share because I have some special uh, <laughs> ties to ceremonies for sure. I think for me, a ceremony is something that um, 
like an honor is bestowed almost or um, a marking of a of a rite of passage you know something like that right like there's a marriage ceremony there's there's often things around birth um, yeah so I think that's the word for me rituals are interesting because I don't think that I actually thought about the things that we do even as a family as rituals until I started looking deeper into what they actually were and then I was like oh some of the stuff that we do you know, when we do Hanukkah, when, when we do things like that, and we always do it in the same way, and we have the way that we do it, and it's our special way, and nobody wants to change it, like, it's totally a ritual for us, right, like, yeah. a lot of those traditions, so, yeah, that's what comes up for me. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, Megan posted, um, postpartum and ceremony comes to me as something missing. Mm, wow, thank you. Uh, and then she elaborated, they are not tied together in my mind, and yet I feel they should be. It's mm. good. I think for myself, like when I think of ceremony, same with like what Jenny said, like I think of marriage ceremony, something that's kind of like orchestrated to honor a, a situation or an event. And then when I think of ritual, I think of like um, manifesting rituals, um, something like that. So they're like, like ceremony and ritual are similar, but I feel like a ceremony is to honor something maybe that's currently happening and a ritual might be, um, I don't know, something to um, be manifesting or like wanting something to happen that's beautiful mm -hmm. or healthy or good. So mm -hmm. my thoughts. Thanks, Jen. Something else to say. I think so much about um, like ceremonies and rituals. Like, well, I think about the, like the baby shower, but all of that seems to occur like before the baby is born. Mm. Uh, you know, we have this celebration, and it is almost a ritual for for everybody to get their baby shower before the baby is born. But then there's nothing really after the baby is born. Yeah, That's great. Yeah, very true. And I, um, I've been blessed to be able to work with some indigenous cultures and, um, you know, uh, Navajo, Apache, Tohono O'odham. Um, unfortunately, I'm not well versed in, in all of their rituals, but I do know that there are some that um, they utilize, especially, you know, um, using a kind of a cradle board is, is a sort of a ritual. Um, and so, um, so I equate it with our indigenous cultures, um, you know, and what I've learned from them. Thank you. Yeah. Tiffany says, what comes to mind for me is something beautiful, a completion of an initiation in this case into parenthood and going from maiden to mother and something I really missed out on having. Mm. Yeah. So good. Are there any feelings associated to these words when you hear them? For me, ceremony feels sacred and like special and like the sun shining down on you in some way, right? <laughs> Tiffany says it feels supportive. Mm. I would say excitement. When I think of ceremony and ritual, I feel excited. I definitely think of, just for myself, I definitely think of women gathering and that feels like exciting and important and special. Yeah. Katie says, honor, security, and relationship. Mm. Megan says, intention. That word's been said quite a few times, intention, yeah. Tiffany says, connection. I feel a desire to experience it and a sadness slash grief over not having had the opportunity. Mm. Yeah. Thanks everyone for sharing a little bit about 
their thoughts, their emotions around these words. Um, I'm just going to share a little bit about my own journey with these words and um, a little bit about how it views, my views right now, how it's shaped everything. Um, I was raised in a pretty conservative, religiously conservative um, family. And, um, and so ceremony and ritual was all about religion to me. It revolved around religion. And um, as I grew and, and into my adulthood, um, I, I drifted away from the church. And, um, but I still felt this deep need and connection to ceremony, to ritual. Um, and how did that look without the formal church? And, and how does that evolve for me? And the deeper, well, the more I traveled and the deeper I got into other communities of the world, I often brought that in as well, that aspect of all these other communities in the world have so many different rich, deep, historic roots in ceremony and ritual. And um, struggling with my own very young culture of America and um, a seemingly uh, perspective of, gosh, we don't have really a whole lot because we're so young and, and our society doesn't um, sometimes value those things outside of religion or outside of a structured organization, um, which tends to be true in a lot of other cultures as well, tied to the religious aspects. But um, for me, it, it became this very almost confusing thing with a lot of weight and a lot of like, I have to. And maybe that was from my background, or maybe that was just, you know, me trying to figure out my stuff. But um, but ceremony and ritual has always been something that I've actually really struggled with and felt a lot of um, expectation maybe um, in that I'm a midwife. So I'm supposed to be this witchy woman that does ceremony and, and you know, holds space for ritual. And, and so feeling that pressure as um, a midwife uh, and also as someone that, that just desires it, but doesn't know how to really have that in my life outside of what I was brought up in. So it's been a really long journey of deciphering through um, what does that look like in my life every day? And then what does that look like as a midwife? And then what does that look like in what I'm teaching my clients and wanting them to experience in their journey as mothers and becoming mothers and after? Um, so it's been, it, it's, it's a lot to unpack <laughs> in these, just these two little words for me and my history and where I'm at. Um, and then there's a whole aspect of, um, you know, being culturally correct with, with what we are taking and embracing from other cultures and, and bordering that line of cultural appropriation and, and the sacred and, and what is ours and what is not ours and, and how, how we, shake that out to become ours is is just a whole bunch of crazy <laughs> makes it crazy sometimes <laughs> um so this this whole realm of stuff i am by no means an expert in any culture in any ritual in any ceremony in any of those aspects um, but i'm a lover of all and the more i i get to know people whether they are as white as I am and as American as I am, or they are, you know, on the other side of the world, um, we are all rich with ritual and ceremony. And um, I've heard a couple of comments that, that um, especially Jenny, uh, you, what you just shared about, you know, the things that we don't even think about um, that we do, the, the way that we set up our menorah or whatever, like it's, it, there is so much ritual in things that we just do. And especially as the holidays approach, we tend to find a lot of ritual um, and a lot of even ceremony um, around these different holidays that are coming up and the way that we do it, the way that we gather, the things that we do first, the things that we set up, the things that we decorate with, right? All of those are aspects of ritual and ceremony. Um, and it's been my most recent journey to really not put a whole lot of weight. Don't be, don't have so many expectations that it has to be this way, but that it can be truly in the everyday simple things. I have my cup of coffee with my husband in the morning, every morning, and that's our time and that's okay. And it's as simple as that, right? It, it can be as simple as that. 
or it can be as elaborate as having a gathering that has decorations and you are decorated and the room is decorated and there are things all around you that are beautiful and there's certain prescribed ways of doing things, all of that. It can be from one end to the other. Um, so as we talk about ceremony and ritual and, a, and specifically in that postpartum period, um, I just hope that a lot of a lot of the things you've said, that connection, um, and especially intention, we're actually going to talk a lot about what that intention, um, that aspect of intention um, has to shine through everything we do. So thank you again for sharing. Is there anything else as I share that anybody wants to bring up or that put in the chat box or um, that we want to, that just wants to say after I shared? Uh, I saw that Megan said um, the word postpartum brings up um, the conflict struggle. Mm, yeah, yes, yes. Cool. So let's now just focus on that postpartum period. So um, thank you for sharing <laughs> going into that. It was a great segue. Uh, so when we think of postpartum in particular and this word postpartum, um, what are some other things? Struggle. What are some other things that come up that are feelings about it or how we view it or whatever? What, what are some thoughts? So for me, all my postpartums were hard. <laughs> um, even when I thought they should be easy, right? Like when I was like, oh, this is your third baby this should be fine. Like, you know, you, you're a lactation consultant, all of this should be just easy for you this time. Um, and it was actually the hardest of all. And so I think that that's, yeah. And, and like, I didn't even prepare myself for it being hard, like much less like other people preparing me. Like I even kind of knew, but I was like, oh, that was that other time. You're different now. <laughs> so yeah, I, I would say, kind of feelings of struggle I think I also feel kind of um I I've done some work around like envisioning myself during that time and like giving her a hug and compassion and I so I think for me I can also kind of look back on it as like wow look who you became during that time you know and and have some love for that person but at the time there wasn't a whole lot of love that I was having for myself <laughs> Yeah. 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 Thank you, Jenny. Jacqueline posted postpartum reminds me of a time to be still. Mm. Yeah. I can say for myself, like when I think of postpartum, I think of the anxiety that I had, which I, on, I mean, I was a midwife and I still didn't know at that time, of, I didn't have a good understanding of postpartum rage. Um, like I didn't even know that's what I was experiencing until I, somebody mentioned that term to me and I was like, what is that? And looked it up and I was like, wow, this is actually really common. So like rage, anxiety, all of those really intense emotions um, is what, comes up for me, one of the things that comes up for me. Um, and then Tiffany said, postpartum was just very lonely, pure survival. I struggled with multiple um, postmortem, uh, PMADS, postpartum mood and depression. What's the S, Jenny? Symptoms? Postpartum mood and anxiety disorders. Or yeah. Um, and didn't have family or friends around to be with me. I wonder, does anyone have a happy postpartum? Laugh out loud, um, she said. And then um, Megan said, oh yes, the rage. <laughs> yeah. I'm not, I'm not a mother myself, um, but with the, the ones who I do support, I, I've heard them talk about, you know, those feelings of isolation and ambivalence and, um, you know, just anxiety and fear, overwhelming exhaustion. Um, so all of those things. And so in my in my mind, from my perspective as as a support person is um, that is the time for action. 
um, you know, um, as well as before, before they, they give birth, if I'm able to give them support and knowledge and let them know, hey, this might be something that's coming. Because a lot of, especially first time moms, you know, um, they may not know that, you know, hey, I'm going to feel ambivalent towards having a baby and, you know, my baby themselves, and this is not my ideal baby um, type of thing. So, um, so really, it's a time for, for me as a support person for action to surround that person with support and care and love and just be a listening ear. Mm -hmm. That's good. Thank you so much. Um, Christy says, nothing, nothing can prepare you for postpartum. It is a wild experience with emotions on all ends of the spectrum paired with a healing body new relationship dynamics, and so much unsolicited advice. <laughs> yeah. um, and then Deanne was helping us out with the PMADS, perinatal mood and anxiety disorders, is what that stands for. Thank you. Um, I personally experienced, I think, two ends of the spectrum. Uh, because of Wendy and Nikki Brewer and a few others, I learned how important postpartum was. I went to a postpartum training and I was like, what? I can delegate all these things to other people. Um, it inspired me to have a nesting party before I gave birth because we moved into a new house. Seven friends came over, unpacked my entire house. And like, I tried to stand up and they'd be like, sit down. Cause I was 36 weeks pregnant. <laughs> and that inspired me. And I wrote people's names down. And I made people very aware when you come over, you're going to do my dishes before you hold my baby, <laughs> you know, in a kinder way, obviously. Um, and the first three months of my postpartum experience were like almost euphoric. I had so many visitors. I had a nice period of just me and my husband and my child and we bonded and we welcomed help in and the, my parents came and they made food. Like I called my dad, chef grandpa <laughs> and um, it was really wonderful. And I mean, I don't want to say my experience is unique because there's a lot of other mothers out there now that experienced the same, but um, in March, everything shut down for me. And it was the same time. It was exactly in line with when I did quit my job. I decided um, I started taking care of my mother-in-law with dementia. Mm -hmm. um, I was a stay-at-home mom my mother-in-law moved in with us and it slowly got worse and worse four five six months mm -hmm. I actually got depression 10 months postpartum and it was pretty hard I've never experienced that and then 18 months postpartum I experienced extreme anxiety in as far as intrusive thoughts and it was the scariest thing I've ever experienced and I know this is going to sound strange but all of this inspired me to become a postpartum doula. And, you know, as scary as those times were, and I reflect on them and they were not enjoyable. They were very lonely. Um, I am thankful that for them too, because now I have these tools under my belt that I hope I can help and support other mothers with and let them know that, you know, they're not alone. And so it was just really interesting for me because I experienced such beauty and support and isolation and loneliness. So it's, it was, I, I'm very happy with my postpartum period and that I advocated for myself and I learned so much for myself, but I also do have grief too, cause I lost a lot. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I love your story and I'm going to go back to it a little later. Cause it's such, thank you. I I'll just say thank you right now. Cause we'll go back to it. Anybody else want to share what postpartum brings up for them? All right, let's measure these two together, rituals, ceremonies, and postpartum. So let's just kind of break it down day by day postpartum. So those, I, I want you to think about what in our culture, East Valley, Arizona, um, what our culture already does for some rituals and ceremonies that you see. Somebody mentioned a baby shower, but that's in pregnancy. So I really want to focus in on anywhere from the moment the baby is born until let's keep it contained to those first two months right now. We'll go deeper, but with Katie's story is very much poignant to that. But right now, let's keep it from the moment the baby is born until about two months postpartum. 
So what are some rituals that you already know that we do or ceremonies that we already do in those times? People have their six week postpartum visit, which I guess isn't exactly a ceremony, but it is something that people, some people do. <laughs> Maybe not everybody who needs it, but yeah. Yeah. Um, Tiffany says, for me, I think it was the dark night of the soul. It was a lot of intensity and growth, stretching my capacity for many things, endurance, et cetera. Just referencing again, what postpartum brings up for her. Thank you, Tiffany. You know, another thing thinking about this now, I think for me, breastfeeding was kind of a ritual. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. For sure. Well, I had a closing of the bones ceremony after I had my daughter, where my friend who was a doula at my birth came and did this whole ceremony. She made a bath for me with herbs and then she like wrapped me up really tight. Um, and we just did this visualization of me closing everything back, like getting my, having my body belong to me exclusively again. And I think that was really helpful. Nice. Um, Christy says, cutting the cord, cord or slash cord burning, mm -hmm. seven sisters, closing of the bones, postpartum bath, belly binding. Yes. And then uh, Deanne says, circumcision for boys can be a ritual. Yes. For sure. Yeah, with my first, I had a doula who came at two weeks, I think, and gave the baby a massage and showed me how to do it. It's kind of a ritual. That was cool. Think about the things that we even just take for granted. Like Jenny was sharing, you know, the, the things that you don't even think about you do, but you do every time, right? Or that you just don't even consider being ritual or ceremony. Deanne says first laugh. First laugh, yes. Bathing the baby. Bathing the baby. Mm -hmm. When you do it, how you do it, yeah. Tiffany says babies for solid foods. Totally. I even thought about like the baby blanket. We always wrap our babies up or we have that special blanket we take to the hospital or is right there, you know, that, that that's what we want our baby to touch because it's the softest or it's this color or we put intention, that word again, into even little things like blankets. Deanne says the White Mountain Apache ceremonial celebration for first giggle or laugh. Hmm. Yeah, I was talking to a mom yesterday who was saying that she pulled all the, the newborn clothes out of her baby's closet, right? That's totally a ritual, right? Like we all go through and oh, it's time to move that forward. Uh-huh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Tiffany says the baby's christening if you're religious. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. For prayers of any kind, I've been at births where like, uh, my Muslim families, they whisper a prayer immediately after birth. Um, and then there's prayers that come along with naming and at certain days, um, it's it, very much surrounding that, yeah. Faith says the monthly milestone pictures and journaling. Yeah, right? Only those stickers. <laughs> <laughs> the big badge. <laughs> I remember for me, it was when my midwife came back to do footprints on a little, um, like a birth certificate that she made, not the official birth certificate, you know, name and the date of birth. And then we put his footprints on it and that felt like a ceremony. Yeah. And that even happens in the hospital. They'll give you that little card. It has the footprints. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Cecilia but says baby's birth announcement. 
Yes, yes. Tiffany How said. you post it on Facebook. <laughs> Tiffany shared in some cultures, the burial of the placenta. Yes. What you do with the placenta surrounding everything having to do with the placenta, right? Even in the hospital, it's cut. Oh, here, dad cut really quick. Boom, boom. And you don't even think about it. That's still a ritual. It's still something that they shove the scissors into the dad's hand. Um, you know, in other ways, you can create anything you want around that too. So many various forms. Deanne says practices around crying and holding the baby. Mm -hmm. And Cecilia says the golden hour, skin to skin. Yeah. You know how um, moms kiss their babies like all the time over and over like whenever they're holding them, like, I feel like that's kind of a ritual too, right? Like, oh. you like can't not do it. <laughs> yes, yes. And how we do it, because how you kiss a baby is different than how I kiss a baby, right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Baby wearing too. That kind of feels like a ritual, like associated with kissing my baby. I just remember baby wearing and then being like, there's a the top of your head. Oh, there's the top of your head. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Mm -hmm. Tiffany was also saying baby wearing and then Deanne says how we talk to baby mother ease mm -hmm. what's mother ease I'm not familiar with that term let me see if this will work long enough for me to tell you because I keep going in and out um mother ease is hi honey how are you today it's a we raise our voice to a high pitch and we elaborate and elongate our words i see i see i understand the word now thank you thank you yeah, for nurturing yeah tiffany says smelling the baby's head and she says yes jenny i still smell my kid's head years later <laughs> oh cecilia says songs we sing stories we tell oh yeah the songs wow I didn't even think about that. Right? Counting fingers and toes. <laughs> what about the involvement of the other family members? Passing the baby to dad, introducing to siblings, how that's done. Well, I'm sure, oh, go ahead, Jen. Oh, uh, uh, Tiffany said saving baby teeth. Um, huh? And yeah. I was going to say one ritual that I I do, I'm like, wow, this is like really a ritual is as a midwife, like having the dad weigh the baby. You know, mm -hmm. like that feels like a ritual as a midwife. Yeah. yeah. The list is exhaustive. And the more you think about it, the more you think about all the things that go into each day and each little milestone and each thing you do that we just take it for granted of. And, um, you know, again, going back to my own baggage around these words and thinking it has to be this elaborate big thing, or I have to create something that's just magical, where when you take it into the everyday mindfulness journey of what you're doing, it all becomes ceremony, it all becomes ritual, it all becomes this sacred moment with your baby and surrounding your baby and yourself and taking care of yourself. And, um, and so I, I, I say that to say, like, again, we often look to these other, you know, exotic places for these things that they do and, and pull from them, which is great. And, and we can learn so much from each other as a global community. But there is so much richness in our in our own community right now that that we've created and that are in the everyday. So I never want to forget those those things that are already in our culture before we dive into everything else. And I want to just start with um, some of the stuff that is part of mom at the very beginning. And this might be rudimentary for for lots of people, but I just want to tip my hat to it really quickly. Um, you know, the moment the baby is born and, and the, the cocktails of hormones and endorphins and everything that's going on in the mom, um, 
brings about this wide openness in the mom in every sense that she has. Her smell is heightened. We talked about smelling the baby. Her, her eyes are wide open. Her ears are wide open. Everything is wide open. And, and even in, in a esoteric sense, you know, that womb is wide open. Her, her physical body is wide open. And, um, and so a lot of the, the rituals and, and the ceremonies that we think about, um, especially when, when centering on the mom and not so much the baby and what we do around the baby, is all about protecting and, and, um, and making sure the mom is protected because of this wide open expanse that the mom is suddenly put into with that hormone cocktail. Um, so it, Every day that goes by that closes a little bit more and closes a little bit more. But when we look globally and we see how other cultures create stuff around the postpartum period and even our own, you know, we think about uh, maternity leave afterwards and we get so many weeks to come away from our normal work, our normal society, our normal job, our normal whatever to have this time of, of of whatever that is, of seclusion, of just chilling out, of whatever. Um, but but it's seen in our society, especially already, that there is this certain time, whatever that time is, um, that we step away from what is normal and step into postpartum. And I think that's really, again, super protective of what is actually physically happening in the mom. And um, I don't know how many people have read uh, that magic book. Oh my gosh, what is it called? Oh, the first 40 days, there it is. <laughs> um, but that's a great book, a great resource to really dive into some of the, the rituals that are global and, and some of those things. But I'm gonna pull from some of those concepts because again, if we wanna get really specific, like what does China do or whatever, um, I'm not an expert, I can't tell you. But what I do know from all of my travels and from you know, a majority by far the countries I've been to and experienced or have studied, um, they have certain elements that are really, really, really like just central in all of the cultures. And I think those are the things that if you want to take away something to, to really hold on to is to look at what is vital through all of them. There, there are these certain things that um, tend to, to run a theme through all of them. So, um, and most of them, again, protecting mom in certain ways of this wide openness that she has and that protection of that, that, open, um, that open sense that moms have immediately and for weeks postpartum. Um, one of the big things that we see is warmth. Warmth is huge. And um, I see this time and time again, right after delivery, the shakes. And we say that's a hormonal rush, but I have witnessed when a woman is warm, whether she's in a warm climate and that room is warm or you throw warm blankets on her and that baby as soon as they're done, those shakes aren't there. And yes, is it hormones? Yes. Did she just run a marathon and you shake after a marathon? Yes, all of those are true. And also that warmth immediately and then following through is in every culture, every culture. And so I think that is something to really ponder like what what's going on? Why do we need that? What's happening in the in mom that that we need to um, whenever we think of comfort and protection and surrounding the words cold and chilly and freezing never come to my mind ever <laughs> an ice bath never comes to my mind <laughs> but a warm bath does right going out in the sunshine and letting the sunshine touch me does so even in in what it conjures up when we want those words of protecting of supporting it, it usually tends towards the warmth. So even if we sub or consciously don't really, you know, like, oh, get me that warm blanket and I need to be bundled or whatever it is, um, subconsciously, I think that we know that those things are what do help support, nourish, um, surround us, protect us is warmth, right? Um, another thing is, uh, 
la, 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 um, foods. So nourishing. And this is in our culture too, right? She just worked out the biggest workout of her life. She just pushed out a baby. She just lost a lot of blood. She, whatever it was. And now she has to feed this baby and continue to feed this baby and continue to, to nourish not only herself, but this baby and possibly another and support a whole family and, 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 right. And so that nourishment aspect is in every single culture, special foods, all the special foods and all of the cultures are usually very nourishing, high protein, high fat to really sustain, give sustenance to that woman. Um, I think even in, in this culture, you know, we, we want, we don't usually give a, salads, you know, we don't usually give a postpartum meal as a salad. We usually give a casserole, warming food, dense food, a soup, a broth, things like that come to our mind if we're giving a postpartum meal. Because again, not only the warmth, but also just we want something that is sustaining, that is really filling that mom, replenishing that mom. Again, that wide open expanse, filling that up so that it is safe, right? So there's that nourishing aspect of it. Um, let me grab my notes really quick, sorry. <clears throat> um, there's also often in almost every culture, some kind of um, physical wrapping of the mom, like whether it's in blankets, cozy up in bed here, that's what we do. We cozy up in bed. Um, in other cultures, they'll do belly binding. In other cultures, there's the bone closing. In other cultures, there's, you know, lots and lots of blankets and that heat aspect again. But often it's that, that real cocooning that we see throughout all different cultures of something coming together and protecting that mom that is wide open um, and protecting that space. So that's another thing that we see lots and lots and lots. Um, I will tell just a really quick story. Um, you know, we, we hear a ton of just beautiful stories, you know, like in Japan, the 40 days and, um, and all, the, all this nurturing, you know, the mom is totally taken care of, especially in a lot of Asian countries, just that, that total taking care of the mom with the warmth and the good foods and the people surrounding. Um, but there is this, um, a story I don't tell often because it is pretty, uh, tragic, um, but it, it shows that there are ways that we can take certain rituals and they cannot be good. Um, so I lived in the Philippines uh, a while back in my early training. And um, again, Asian country that is really all about the warmth of the mom afterwards. And um, this mom, I helped her through her birth and um, released her from the clinic after a couple of days. And, or no, she was just there for two days. And um, she went home. And then about two days after that, we found out that she had died. And she died because she went to see a traditional healer that embrace this warmth and touch and holding the mom but what he used because what he had was gasoline and kerosene and he rubbed this woman up and down with kerosene and gasoline and then wrapped her up um, so he was trying to do the best he could with the resources he had and the cultural things that were appropriate and she ended up dying from third and fourth degree burns and her body was just it was crazy um, so I say that in that there are these, these cultural things that we, we, um, we experience or that we think are these, um, these beautiful things um, that, you know, if we don't know how to use them appropriately or we don't have the resources to use them um, can be really detrimental. Um, the belief system that comes with ceremony and ritual um, can be really powerful and overpowering what we, um, what our, our, our thinking mind might really process as this could be dangerous, right? So 
taking all of these things from the global world and, and what we do um, and really making sure that we're also safe with them. So I just put that in there to, to be safe as a disclaimer, because I'm a lawyer, but also as practical experience, you know, as, as seeing my only maternal death was due to somebody really trying to do ceremony that they thought was what was right and, and ended up really harming this mom. Um, anyways, on to better things, right? Uh, the last thing I really want to focus on that is again through all, all, all of everything that this is like the most vital part, I think, and I've already said it, is community. When we look at other cultures and when we look at postpartums, Katie, I'm going to go back to yours, is um, when, when, when women feel very supported and nurtured and taken care of, it is only because community is there and community is so, so vital. And when we're looking at Asian countries, all the Asian countries I've been to in African countries, they're, they're communal by nature. It is not something that they have to conjure up or force. They live in generational housing. They live very close in community. They're, they're very um, community centered. And so everything they do, is never alone. <laughs> and um, when we started this and I heard some of the feedback about postpartum, I heard loneliness, I heard alone, I hear, heard um, you know, isolation. These were some of the words that I heard a lot of actually. And I hear a lot of in my practice and listening to people all the time. This is what I hear in our culture, especially. Um, and when we, when we see globally rituals and practices, um, it involves a lot of community um, and usually never aloneness, truly aloneness. Um, and in this culture, when we are desiring to have something different as our postpartum, involving ritual, involving ceremony, involving intentionality, it does take intention. Bottom line, it has to take intention because our society is not so much communal by nature. We do not live usually in generational housing. We do not live even close to our neighbor. You know, We have to walk out to the sidewalk and walk around the house and walk to the next door to even find the, per the closest person next to us. So the intentionality that goes into creating a postpartum that is all the things that we, you know, hear about or um, read about in these other cultures um, can absolutely happen here, but without intention and without really planning, they're not going to happen naturally as they do in most other countries. Um, so a huge part of this is planning, is planning even before you get pregnant, but for sure in pregnancy, um, planning, 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 planning for your postpartum, I think is even more important than your birth. <laughs> and I am a midwife, it's all about birth, but um, a birth is for a moment, right? 24 hours, maybe. Postpartum, weeks, months, years, right? And if we don't have plans for that time to have the support we need, to have the plan in place to survive each day, all of the things that we hear again and again and again and again about postpartum um, are, are going to be there because that's how most of our society lives, right? So um, if you haven't gotten your hands on the first 40 days book, I do recommend that, you know, get a kickback or anything. It's just a great book. Um, and Seven Sisters in particular is a great method. I'm not going to go into great detail because of, of time. And I do want to hear a little bit about um, anybody that has done planning and what they've done. But um, without a plan in place, we are going to go with our status quo that is part of our culture, which is, is isolation, which is loneliness. But with a plan in place of creating ritual, creating ceremony, creating a plan, creating steps to make sure that you are taken care of, whether it is in that warmth, whether it is in nourishing meals every day, whether it is in um, how you bathe afterwards and who takes care of you coming over to draw that bath for you and put you in it. 
it takes community by far. So community runs throughout all of the cultures of the world in creating space to do these rituals and to take care of the mom so that these rituals can happen. Um, I, I really resonated with Katie's um, story in that the people that I have, you know, helped and and walked with we do only usually talk about the first couple months of having a real solid postpartum plan um, meals help in the house help with whatever um, that usually is really solid if we have a good plan for the first you know weeks and months um, and then after that life gets back to normal and sometimes that normal oftentimes that normal is isolation is is loneliness, is life changes that we don't have a plan for, that we aren't calling on community and, um, and life spirals down, right? So um, it was, it, and Katie, please correct me if I'm wrong, just that short blurb I heard from your story that you really did plan a lot for that immediate weeks and, and months after postpartum, but that help wanes, that plan ends and mm -hmm. life goes on, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so just remembering that our postpartum period and when we need to ask for help and what we need to do and, and um, the things that we create in our lives to sustain us, <laughs> nourishing food, warm weather, things like that, um, continue on beyond the two months, right? They continue on of needing our community gatherings like this, even though it's once a month coming and knowing that we're going to sit among sisters that understand, they get it, they get it on a real and raw level. And I can open my heart and my space to, to this space to, to know that I'm going to be heard. And even that it's a ritual, right? Coming here once a month and being together and sharing who I am, who my family is, and then listening is, is a ritual in and of itself. So um, my intention was not to totally give you like, here's the ritual steps. <laughs> it was more to really open your, your mind that there's, there's common themes and those themes are really important and how they play out in your life and how they play out in, in what you prepare for your postpartum can be really important. They are actually physically, you know, evidence-based that depression is lowered when you have community around you and your body heals when it is warm and, you know, your body, your body can uh, rejuvenate when you have good food. All those things are no brainers. And yet if we're not intentional and we don't think about them, they're not built into our society in particular, like it, they are in a lot of other global societies. So, um, it just takes that much more work planning and intention for those things. So um, I do want to hear if anybody had a plan for their postpartum, what it looked like. Katie, I know you briefly shared about if you want to share more depth, how you actually planned for that. And did it include ceremonies? Did it include rituals like Jen shared? Jen shared about some, some ceremonies that happened that she really wanted in her postpartum. And anybody else, please, I, I would love to hear how you specifically planned and were there, did they include um, more specifics uh, about rituals and, and ceremony. I can go ahead and share a little more. Mm -hmm. um, I think when I got pregnant, I just knew I needed to make a life change. I, I had a lot of, uh, you know, trauma that I had been working on for many years and it inspired me that I needed to ask for help and more importantly, accept the help because it's really hard to ask, but it's even harder to accept it because I can do it myself. I'm a very self-sufficient person. I've done it myself my whole life. Why wouldn't I do this by myself? Cause it's my daughter, you know? So that inspired me that I wanted my daughter's life to be different and teach her how to ask for help and teach her that community is important. So that's what inspired me. Um, I have to say like, uh, where I gave birth and, uh, you know, being in contact with Nikki Brewer was a very important part of my postpartum period and her postpartum workshop blew my mind. I didn't know the things at all that she shared that you could have a list of things for people to do call like she did dabbled on the seven sisters and call on those important females in your life because I will say I have learned that the village is a bit sparse unfortunately it's not what it used to be maybe 
like you said, we're very distant from each other, but like when stuff really gets tough, like moms supporting moms is amazing. And we are our best support system. Um, I remember a list of things that she had given me that you could delegate out, like have somebody check your emails if it's that important. Um, who's going to pick up the mail? Who's going to get groceries? Do you have somebody to cook meals? The teeniest things were on that list that I never thought like I could set down and not do. And so, like I said, you know, I knew my parents were super excited to come, but I also wanted them to know, like, this is what I need when you come. So I called them and I said, Hey, my dad's really good cook. Could you be chef grandpa while you're here? And can we count on you for our meals and snacks? And he was like, yeah, woo!" he was so excited and proud. My mom is a pretty, um, emotionally kind person. And, you know, I was taking care of my daughter. My fiance was taking care of me. Um, and who's taking care of him? Nikki made me think about that. And so I asked my mom, you know, can you check in with Jeff too and ask him how he's doing? And if he needs anything, does he need to step outside and go for a walk? Cause you know, he's physically able to do a little more than I was like the first, you know, couple weeks, months. Um, my midwives in particular said five days in bed, five days around the bed, five days around the house. And that was a lot less than what I read in the first 40 days. And I was like, you know what? That's a lot less. Let me see if I can do it. You know, it might fit Western society a little more. And I found that like, I just let myself do it. I stayed in bed for five days and I think it went into like 10 days and I just laid with my baby and I nursed and I just really shed this idea that I had to be busy and get stuff done. And, um, plus when I remember the first time I stood up, Oh my God, I felt so heavy from the waist down and my legs took longer to recover than anything, honestly, than, you know, my, uh, vagina. <laughs> and so that just all these messages that I was, I was going out to learn. They were also coming back to me and teaching me like, take care of yourself. This is what you can do. Um, I'm trying to think that's kind of like basically what I did. And I will say a lot of it had to do with me doing the planning and reaching out and getting, you know, picking up that thousand pound phone and asking for help because it's very hard because we've been taught to not ask for help. And um, I don't know. I was just like, nope, times are changing, you know, and I did lose support. It did. I want to say it was mostly because of quarantine hit, unfortunately. So it was very specific and unique that that happened. Mm -hmm. um, I would hope that my community would have still been there. And the people in my pod were still there. The people that we agreed to see and keep safe and not see other people. So I still saw my um, brother-in-law and his wife, and I still saw people that were in our pod. So it did work out for the most part, you know, but part of me just believes my experience had to be what it was because it's leading me now to a different path to help other mothers with postpartum care. So yeah. that's kind of like my journey. That's so great. There's probably more. I'll write a book one day. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. <Just> kidding. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to pop us off of live guys. Hold okay. on.